Welcome to my favorite corner of my apartment and welcome to or back to my channel. I'm Kit and today Evie Magazine is showing their hand. Before we get into it, I would like to note that the following are my thoughts and opinions on the content we're about to read. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below along with sources and resources. And now onto the reason we're all here. Evie Magazine. Actually, I'm going to read the opening paragraphs from a Vice article about the magazine because it expresses my thoughts beautifully. Scrolling through Evie Magazine's Facebook page, everything seems almost normal. In a recent post titled The Danger of Shows Like Netflix's You, a writer blogs about the streaming service's third season hit. An article about the five signs you're dating a man-child is surely of interest to plenty of women in their 20s and 30s, Evie's target audience. But then it gets weird from we should teach about the dangers of pornography in sex ed to feminism doesn't help sexual violence survivors, it just perpetuates victimhood to hey CDC, get your hands off our pregnant bodies, EV Magazine is clearly less an average women's magazine than an exercise in a very specific type of right-wing messaging wrapped in a strained and often slipping imitation of the way those magazines talk to their audiences. And that pretty much sums up their political quiz. They call democracy a blessing, say they don't outright endorse candidates, and claim to want to provide us with a quick quiz to help us figure out who we want to vote for based on our values. That sounds great, but as I quickly discovered, the author, Andrea Muse, actually isn't subtle about her bias. Unsurprising, given that she manages storytelling for the Independent Women's Forum, which is a conservative nonprofit. And hey, having a bias is fine, most people have one. The problem comes in when you pretend you don't have one. Let's get into it. Every four years, Americans have the opportunity to partake in the election of our next US president. Sometimes that ends up being the incumbent, AKA the sitting president. But in 2024, neither candidate from the major parties, Democrat and Republican, is currently serving as POTUS. This election cycle, former president Donald Trump who served as president from 2016 to 2020, and current vice president Kamala Harris, serving alongside President Joe Biden, are duking it out. And we the people are blessed with a chance to elect just one. I would like to pause for a moment here and note that Evie links to two other articles in this section. The first proclaims the media is trying to rebrand Kamala Harris as brat, but it's giving Hillary Clinton. The media isn't being honest about Kamala Harris's vibes and you know it. I'm sorry, are we voting based on vibes? And the second, debate moderators slammed for bias against Donald Trump and failing to fact check Kamala Harris. Let me guess, the debate moderators are voting for Kamala Harris this November. I don't want to live in a world where because one political party lies as easy as they breathe, that means the other party can do the same, but the simple fact is that Trump could have been fact checked a lot more than he was that night. And he didn't just lie. He told some outlandish stories, stories that could actually put people in danger. So no, I'm not going to be upset that Trump was corrected, what, a whole three times? But it is important to be accurate. I'll link a video below fact checking Harris. American democracy is just that, a blessing that set global precedents for democratic government and we directly benefit from it. Our elections are spicy and exciting as vibrant public discourse bubbles up as we inch closer and closer to November, but sometimes people may find it tough to parse out which candidate best aligns with their personal values. We at EV don't outright endorse candidates, clever, saying they don't outright endorse, but instead want to provide you with a quick quiz to help you figure out who you want to cast your vote for in the upcoming presidential election based on what you want for your future. Ready? Open up a tab in your notes app or reach for a sticky note and pen to tally how many ones and twos you answer. I'm going to give you all a moment to do that. Let's go. When it comes to the cost of living, I think that it's okay for the cost of goods and services to rise if that means that social welfare programs like government-run healthcare or unemployment benefits can be available to the masses. It's a necessary evil to support all Americans, but also illegal immigrants too. Wow. Okay. First, I love calling supporting Americans a necessary evil. And I also enjoy how they throw in illegal immigrants because the US is just so generous with Medicare and unemployment. Also, the government doesn't set the prices of goods and services provided by private companies and those purchases don't fund our government. It's not acceptable for runaway inflation to fundamentally change the power of the American dollar. I mean, 
$80,000 in the 1990s is approximately equal to 2024's $129,000. So how am I ever supposed to follow in my parents' footsteps in becoming a homeowner? I can hardly even afford groceries right now. Okay, but... How will voting for Trump fix inflation? Do they think the president can just say inflation ends now and everything will be fixed? Are they aware that this is a global issue, not just an American one? Do they know why rent is rising? Do they know why it's hard to buy a house right now? Do th you know what? I'll stop asking questions. And for anyone interested, I'll link Legion Miller's recent video about why groceries are so expensive and how Trump will make it worse. When it comes to immigration, I think that it's racist to close or even secure our borders and enforce more rigorous immigration policies. They're not illegal aliens, they're asylum seekers, and it's America's job to open our arms to outsiders and ensure they feel welcome and supported. If this person was paying attention, they would know the calls are for immigration reform, but honestly, I doubt they care. It's troubling that our government allows anyone in and refuses to deport bad apples, promising them amnesty and even free health care. Legal immigration is part of the American dream and what makes our nation so uniquely diverse, but it's predicated on respect, hard work, and an understanding of law and order. What a bunch of nonsense. The American government doesn't allow anyone in and refuse to deport bad apples. Again, there is a difference between asylum seekers and immigrants. Again, not everyone is allowed in. Again, the Biden administration deports people, bad apples or not. And Biden also kept Trump's Title 42, and when it expired, he implemented a rule that migrants must request refugee status before entering the U.S. And you know, I am so curious. If Trump is such a great guy, the right choice, why the need to lie? When it comes to abortion, I think that... It's not the government's place to weigh in on what a person with a uterus does with their bodies. Especially if that means whether or not they can continue a pregnancy. If we can legally regulate abortion access, people can more safely terminate unwanted life rather than doing so in secrecy. Especially since we are becoming a more sex-positive society, we need to empower uterus havers to feel a sense of control over their future. Thanks for the inclusivity, but I would like to add it's not about secrecy. Having to go underground because abortion is illegal would make it dangerous, not to mention the possibility of, oh, I don't know, being arrested? And yes, that does and is currently happening. See below for sources. And it's not just about having a sense of control over the future. It's about having control of your body and what happens to it. And even for people eager to have kids, access to abortion is important because so much can go wrong with pregnancy and exceptions don't actually do anything. It should really be up to the states to decide what their own policies are on things like abortion. I may have my own opinions about abortion, but Roe v. Wade was unacceptable to me as it expanded the power of the federal government when we're supposed to have federalism, meaning state governments more accurately reflect the preferences of their populace. So to be clear, Roe was unacceptable because it expanded the power of the federal government to allow abortions, but state governments criminalizing abortion isn't expanding the power of government. Anyway, it doesn't matter what people of a certain state want. If you don't want to have an abortion, that's fine, but whether or not someone else has an abortion shouldn't be up to anyone but that person. When it comes to public safety, I think that we really need to restructure public safety systems to make them more equitable and address systemic inequalities. If some, or maybe even all, of the resources allocated to police departments could instead go to government-run social service programs, I think we'd have less crime on the streets. Okay. I know that a strong, well-trained law enforcement presence is necessary to maintain public order. I can't understand why we'd put violent criminals back on the streets and then defund the police, leaving innocent Americans vulnerable. I'm scared of raising a family in a country overwhelmed by rising crime rates and drug addiction. No city has defunded the police and crime rates have been falling for three decades. And considering how high our incarceration rate is... Has it occurred that perhaps policing isn't the most effective crime deterrent? It is very interesting though, the way this is set up. You're either defunding the police or giving them more money. There's no idea of police reform. You must go dramatically in one direction or the other. When it comes to gender ideology, I think that trans women are women and trans men are men and to say otherwise is bigoted. I think that people get way too worked up about children experimenting with their gender identity. Medical professionals and schools are simply responding with compassion to a growing number of trans-identifying students and honestly, it's a good thing that we're liberated from regressive sex stereotypes. Okay. 
Vulnerable, impressionable children are easily swayed by the gender ideology movement. Some parents, K-12 educators or administrators, and even medical professionals are wrongfully pushing kids down a path of harmful and sometimes irreversible gender transition, even though they often change their minds once they've matured. Children cannot be born in the wrong body, though there is a tiny percentage of humans born with differences of sexual development, but there are exceptions to the biological rule. This is bizarrely vague, but reading between the lines, rapid onset gender dysphoria has been debunked, as has the notion that trans kids often change their minds. And though these folks so, so badly want us to believe that kids are having surgery, transitioning for minors is usually social, very, very rarely is surgery involved. When it comes to healthcare, I think that... Healthcare is a human right and it's up to our government to provide comprehensive healthcare coverage to every American or person who enters our country. A system like this eliminates the need for private health insurance and standardizes care so there is equitable access for all. This might mean an increase in taxes to fund the system, but perhaps people would save money in the long run by not having to pay for private insurance or medical bills. Okay. Government-run healthcare systems like Medicare for All are inefficient and the quality of care can be pitiful. Why else would so many Brits bemoan that the NHS's single-payer system makes them wait months just to get an appointment? People should be able to shop for plans and rack up pre-tax dollars for medical expenses in health savings accounts, HSA. I believe that free market solutions encourage competition, which drives down costs and improves the quality of care I could receive. I'm so tired of Republicans defunding programs and then claiming they don't work and people buy it. But yes, I am so glad I can shop for cost-efficient care because I wouldn't be able to afford higher quality care when I'm having a stroke or bleeding out or in a car accident. This is a little funny to me because conservatives are the ones who talk about the hard-working Americans in rural, real America. And then they talk about racking up pre-tax dollars in HSAs and free market solutions. Yeah, because in a town of 1,200 people, you have your choice of doctors. Also, I have British family members and Canadian friends, and none of them have complained about their systems. They have, however, expressed horror over how the US does it. Go figure. When it comes to climate change, I think that... We need to take bold, urgent action to address climate change. We can't rely on people to do it voluntarily. We need to set a goal for transitioning the US to 100% renewable energy to avert climate catastrophe. It's time to phase out fossil fuels, ban fracking, and make massive investments in solar panels and wind farms. Sneaky, sneaky. We can't rely on people to do it voluntarily. I see what they're trying to do there. And yes, phasing out and replacing things that worsen climate change is a must. We can't really just ignore this and hope it goes away or magically fixes itself. We only have one planet. I'm skeptical of large-scale government interventions in the energy sector. If we had more energy independence and weren't discouraged from producing oil and natural gas, we wouldn't have to rely on, sometimes hostile, foreign energy sources. I'm not against clean energy solutions. I just think that private industry can make better, quicker technological advancements if ineffective environmental regulations didn't squash innovation. The United States is producing more oil and natural gas today than ever before, and far more than any other country. Under each of the three most recent presidencies, Republican and Democratic alike, U.S. oil and gas production was higher at the end of the administration's term than at the beginning. I honestly can't figure out if the author is just bad at researching or if she believes her own BS. When it comes to foreign policy, I think that we need to rebuild and strengthen international alliances like those of NATO and the European Union. If we ice out other countries with aggressive rhetoric, there may be more tensions. That said, I definitely support Ukraine and think that we need to continue U.S. military aid to fight back against Russian expansionism and election interference. Okay. We need to put America first. If our nation isn't strong, how can we be a model of strength for any other country? We'll never be respected on the global stage if we kowtow to countries like Russia, Iran, or China. This is why I agree with protectionist trade policies like higher tariffs and support for increased military and defense spending. That said, I don't like it when we go on the offense and get involved in endless wars. I think peace can be achieved through strength. How much strength is the U.S. lacking? What does kowtowing to Russia, Iran, and China look like? The U.S. spent $820 billion in 2023 for defense. How much more do they want to spend? Do they even know what they want the money for? If you answered mostly ones, your candidate is likely Kamala Harris. A vote for Harris means a vote for liberal immigration reform, including fewer barriers to entry. 
That's interesting. I thought the author believed Harris was in favor of open borders? And criminal justice reform, which includes reducing recidivism and improving law enforcement accountability, despite Harris's own prosecutorial record showing otherwise. The link goes to a Heritage Foundation article, and the Heritage Foundation is behind Project 2025, so please forgive me if I don't find them credible. The article also includes this line, it's the White House, the truth matters. Does it? Because it seems to me that conservatives are more than happy to look the other way when it's their candidate that's making up not just lies, not just misspeaking, but inventing a whole new reality altogether. Harris also supports economic justice by increasing the minimum wage and expanding workers' rights through unionization. Though in Harris's home state of California, where both of those policies have already been set in motion, income inequality is only getting worse. This link goes to a Twitter post about how California taxes are driving out high earners and I'm baffled. Harris represented California in the federal Senate, not the state Senate. Do they really think she was setting policies for California? Harris voters probably don't mind an increase in government authority over your life. This person might want to read Project 2025. Since you believe in single-payer health care rather than the power of private insurance. The power of private insurance? To do what? Drive you into debt? Even if you believe that America can be a great nation, you'd prefer not to show dominance over other countries, even if that means being perceived as submissive. Because you're globally minded and believe in the growth of international organizations like the World Health Organization, WHO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. If you answered mostly twos, your candidate is likely Donald Trump. A vote for Trump means a vote for conservative pro-business policies, including deregulation, tax cuts, and trade deals that prioritize American workers and domestic manufacturing. Correction, pro-business policies support businesses, not workers. Trump supports merit-based immigration policies, but strongly opposes illegal immigration, advocating for a strong border wall. Interesting. They were so eager to point out Harris's flaws, even things she had no part in, even using opinion and commentary articles as sources, but nothing about how Trump promised a border wall, which didn't happen, that would be funded by Mexico, which also didn't happen. The deportation of undocumented migrants. No mention of the nearly 1,000 kids that went missing thanks to Trump's separation policy. And the end of sanctuary cities. Trump also supports a strong military but advocates for ending endless wars, a stance he championed when previously in office by diplomatically confronting countries like North Korea, Iran, and China, and avoiding any new conflicts. You prefer market-driven healthcare reforms and limited government involvement, opposing large-scale programs run by the government like Medicare for All. You also prioritize an America-first approach to the U.S.'s involvement in international organizations like the WHO or NATO because you believe we carry an unfair burden and that globalist organizations are often biased or mismanaged. This all sounds so familiar. I'm just going to freestyle my thoughts. Apologies in advance if they're hard to follow. These folks act as though Trump wasn't president for four years. Why not tout his accomplishments? Why not broadcast his plans? Is it because, despite those four years, he has no accomplishments and his plans are concepts of plans? Hell, why not talk about those concepts? Instead, they obfuscate, distract, lie, blame. They say nothing concrete. They throw out exaggerations or outright fiction and say they alone can fix it. Anyone else will just make things worse. But please, gaslight me. Tell me that Trump is just some nobody who worked his way up. Tell me that the more times someone declares bankruptcy, the more successful they are. Tell me that someone who never gave a damn about anyone else actually cares about the American people. Tell me that someone born into the elite isn't elite. Tell me that someone who sells his own Bible is a devout Christian, second to Jesus, if not maybe, just maybe, the second coming. Please, I can't get enough of this mindfuckery. I'm proud to be partnering with my very good friend, Lee Greenwood, who doesn't love his song, God Bless the USA, in connection with promoting the God Bless the USA Bible. This Bible is the King James Version and also includes our founding father documents, yes, the Constitution, which I'm fighting for every single day very hard to keep Americans protected. Also, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance are all part of this. God bless the USA Bible. And it's just very important and very important to me. I want to have a lot of people have it. You have to have it for your heart, for your soul. Many of you have never read them and don't know the liberties and rights you have as Americans and how you are being threatened to lose those rights. It's happening all the time. It's a very sad thing that's going on in our country, but we're going to get it turned around. Religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country. 
and I truly believe that we need to bring them back, and we have to bring them back fast. I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. All Americans need a Bible in their home, and I have many. It's my favorite book. It's a lot of people's favorite book. This Bible is a reminder that the biggest thing we have to bring back America and to make America great again is our religion. Religion is so important. It's so missing, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back strong, just like our country is going to come back strong. In the end, we do not answer to bureaucrats in Washington. We answer to God in heaven. Christians are under siege. We must protect content that is pro-God. We love God, and we have to protect anything that is pro-God. We must defend God in the public square and not allow the media or the left-wing groups to silence, censor, or discriminate against us. We have to bring Christianity back into our lives and back into what will be, again, a great nation. Our founding fathers did a tremendous thing when they built America on Judeo-Christian values. Now that foundation is under attack, perhaps as never before. What can we do? Stand up, speak out, and pray that God will bless America again. I'm proud to endorse and encourage you to get this Bible. We must make America pray again. Pray, get educated, get motivated, and stand with me and the legions of Americans asking God to bless our great nation, to bring our great nation back, and to make America great again. I'm proud to partner with Lee in this offering. He's a very special man, both as a talent, but maybe even more so as a human being. He's very, very special. And I think you all should get a copy of God Bless the USA Bible now and help spread our Christian values with others. There you have it. Let's make America pray again. God bless you, and God bless the USA. Hello? What is this? Make America pray again? How is buying a Bible going to do that? And why would you want to make someone pray? That goes against the whole point. I would also like to note that that Bible is $60. And if you want the one signed by Trump, a Bible signed by Trump, it's $1,000. Just, hello? And for anyone who might be listening and thinking I'm just upset because I'm a Harris fan or whatever, no. I don't care about politicians, but the cult that's sprung up around Donald Trump, of all people, is bizarre and deeply concerning. And I am so tired of this dynamic. These folks say whatever they want, and we're supposed to take it seriously no matter how lazy or out there the claim. It's ridiculous, and I don't know how we got roped into playing by those rules. All that being said, please vote. I have a link below so you can check if you're registered. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.